Windowing functions are a great way of letting a row be aware of what's going on around it, not just in the current row, but in all its neighbors. I like to know what's going on with my neighbors too, so that's why I'm a couple of blocks away from my own home, looking into the home of, actually the basement of, David and Angela Matthews. I like to see what they're up to. Oh, they're home. And she just saw me. And she's calling the cops. I think this would be a good time to leave. Of all the windowing functions out there, row number is probably the most familiar to you for a couple of reasons. Number one, it's been around since SQL Server 2005. It's actually one of the oldest windowing functions SQL Server has. The other reason is it's enormously popular. At one time or another, pretty much every developer has a need for ranking or row numbering a result set. And up until 2005, we had to roll our own code in order to get that sort of output. Now the row number function simply puts it out for us it's built into SQL Server, so everyone that sees it understands exactly how it works and exactly what it does. Speaking of how it works, let's take a look at the syntax of it. So we've got the row number function, followed by the over clause, which establishes the scope of the row number. And then here we have partition by roll date. So what we're telling it is we want to reset that counter every time we move to a new roll date. So we'll count one up to the last row on a certain date, say January 1st, and then when we hit January 2nd, we'll start that counter over again, and so on and so forth. And then we have the order by clause, which tells us that we want that row number to be applied in the order of the role ID. So let's take a look at how this would work then. So we've got role ID number one, which happened to be January 1st, Player ID rolled the 20-sided die and got a five. That was roll number one for the day. Roll ID number four was the second roll of the day. That's because roll IDs number two and three took place in between, but here we're just looking at the 20-sided dice. So this is an instance where we can't trust the built-in ID if we want to limit the result set at all. So if we only want to look at 20-sided dice, we're going to create gaps in the data and then we have to smooth over those gaps by using the row number function. Pretty simple, pretty straightforward. If we wanted to, we could add more columns to the partition by roll date so we could see the roll date and the player ID cause the row number to reset. So let's take a look at what that would look like. And before I execute it, let's go down here. We had 21 rolls on January 1st. We'll run that, and of those 21 rolls that we saw before, five came from player one, three came from player two, five from player three, and eight from player four. So pretty straightforward how it works. Partition by just says when to reset the counter. So in this case, we're telling it reset the counter with every roll date or player ID change. Let's look at the sum window function. Now in our query here, we've got select the roll date, player ID, die sides, die roll. And we wanna to add to this the sum of the die roll. Now, sum is different from row number and rank in that it's not a ranking window function, it's an aggregation window function. But what makes sum kind of goofy here is that we're selecting other columns, but we're not saying anything in the over clause. We're not saying partition by. And nowhere in our query is a group by. Now, if you look at this the way that you look at a traditional sum function, you might think that's gonna break because we can't possibly have a sum and other columns without grouping by those other columns. And this is where you kind of have to think along a different line with window functions. No matter what you scope a windowing function with, it won't affect any of the other columns. It won't affect the number of rows that you get back. It won't change anything. All it will apply to is that one column. So let's take a look at this sum of the die roll. 
And if we don't specify any partition by, we'll get the grand total. What we can do with the sum window function is scope it down. We can partition it by the roll date and we can partition it by the roll date and the player ID. So we can get the grand total of all the rolls, we can get the total of all the rolls for that day, and we can get the total of all the rolls for that day for that player. No matter what we do with any of these window functions, we will not change the number of rows that we're going to get back, and we won't affect any of the other columns. So I'll run this again, and we can see that for January 1st, our grand total is unchanged, but for January 1st, the day sums up to 203, and for that player, the sum is 37. So player one rolled a combined 37, player two rolled a combined 25, three rolled a 56, and player four rolled an 85. Now, if we look at this sum number, the day total and the player day total, these aren't really useful numbers. They don't tell us much. They demonstrate syntax, but there's no real intelligence that you can glean from this. So let's move on to a function that might tell us a little bit more about what's going on. Since sum isn't all that helpful, let's look at average, which might be a little bit better for analytical purposes in this case. So we've got the same query, select roll date, player ID, die sides, die roll, and we want to look at the average die roll, partitioned first by the roll date to tell us the average roll for that day, regardless of who rolled the die, and then the average roll partitioned by the roll date and the player so we can see what a player's average was for any given day. And it starts to get a little more interesting and a little more fun when we look at numbers this way. So let's check it out. Player ID number one on January 1st rolled an average of seven. Player two rolled an average of eight. Player three was a little bit luckier, got 11. And player four got 10. And then we move over to the next day. And the cycle continues, so on and so forth. And if we scroll down here, we can see that Player two had a pretty rough day on January 3rd, rolling a 20-sided die. Their average is only six, and if we scroll down a little farther, we'll probably find someone. Uh, player four had a pretty lucky day there. 14, 14, 14, and 20, nice. So using these window functions, again, pretty simple syntax. All you have to do is take the function and then the over clause to specify how you wanna kind of scope it down. So you can say, you just want it to apply to a date, player ID, and so on and so forth, however you like. But you can get some really useful information very quickly, and you don't have to go through the trouble of doing a group by because these are applied to every single row. Again, we don't cut down on the number of rows that we get back. We simply add intelligence to the rows we already have. Let's take a look at some other window functions now. With SQL Server 2012, we got a bunch of new windowing functions that allow us to kind of take census of our result set. And we can do that from any position, any row in the result set. Before we had these functions, if you ask a given row, what's going on around it? How does it compare to others? Except for the row number and rank, it really wouldn't know. But now we've got these special functions like lag and lead, which are enormously helpful, and you'll see how in just a moment. So our query has the roll date, player ID, die sides, die roll, and then I'm going to use both the lag and lead function. Lag simply looks back over its shoulder, lead looks ahead. So in this instance, I wanna know about what? I wanna know about the die roll, so I'm gonna say lag and then in parentheses, the die roll. So I wanna know about the die roll that is behind me. How many rows behind me? I'm gonna say one. And then with the over clause, I will say, I need to make sure that these are ordered so I always get the same results back every time. Or I'll order by the roll date. And then I'll label that column the previous roll. Same with lead, I'll say, I'll look ahead. I wanna know about the die roll that's in front of me. How many rows in front of me? One. I'll order it by the roll date so I know that my results are consistent. 
and then I'll say that will be the next role. And if I execute it, it will look exactly like you think it will. So we'll get the role date, the player ID, die sides, die role. Now in that first role, there wasn't a previous role, so that's gonna come back as null. In the next column over, I'm asking what's the role that took place right in front of me, the next one down the list. So if my die roll here is five, I wanna know what the next roll is. It's gonna be a one. I can actually find that out in the current row. Pretty cool, huh? I can look as far ahead or as far back as I wanna go. I can target four rolls ahead, 10 rolls ahead, doesn't matter. It's really neat that you can take a certain row and ask it about other rows in the result set and it will know the answer. So if you wanted to do something say, totally unrelated to our crossbows and cursors database, say you needed to do this period last year, this period last month, any sort of period to period comparison, this is fantastic for doing that because you can look a certain number of quarters back or a certain number of months or a certain number of years, whatever the case. Now you'll notice that the role previous was null because no value existed. There is a little trick that you can do with lag and lead to get rid of that null value. So I'm gonna go ahead and insert it here. I'm gonna say, I wanna know about the die roll that happened one row previous to mine. But if there isn't one, then I'm going to say it was zero. I'm going to assign a default value in case the expression returns a null. And there, now I actually have a different value. So if you need to handle that null somehow, if null won't be good enough in the result set itself, you can always assign a default value if no value is returned by that expression. Now you might be asking yourself, okay, so I can lag and I can lead a certain number of rows, but what if I don't want a certain number of rows in one direction or the other? I wanna know the first or the last value, and that could be any number of rows in between. Well, you're in luck because there's a windowing function for that. Let's take a look. Lag and lead will allow us to look a fixed number of rows in either direction. But first value and last value will allow us to look all the way to the front and all the way to the back, regardless of how many rows might exist in between. So we have the same query here, roll date, player ID, die sides, die roll. And we wanna look at the very first die roll and we'll order these by roll date and we'll look at the very last die roll ordered by the roll date. And we'll go ahead and run this. And what we should see is the roll first value across the entire result set should be the same. Result set, sound like Sean Connery. It should be the same and it should be five. Is it a match? Sure is. Our first roll in the entire result set was a five. And so everybody knows we're on board with that. It's a five. So the very last roll in the result set should be 19. Let's go take a look. Hmm, that's not right, that's not 19. What happened? Now our first roll is being recorded correctly across the entire result set, but the last one is wrong. What's up with that? Well, in order for me to explain what's going on, we're gonna have to move on from this and then come back to it. So we're gonna move on to look at another window function, clause, that will help explain what's going on with this first value, last value. So let's step out and look at the rows between clause. So we're returning back to the sum windowing function and we're gonna add a little wrinkle this time. Remember that the over clause determines the scope of how that windowing function is applied. So we can do partition by, we can do order by, we already know that. But there's a third one that we want to add, the rows between. And rows between simply says, I want you to look a certain distance back in terms of row count or a certain distance forward. So we have three choices really. We have unbounded, which means go as far as you can go in that direction. We have current row, which obviously means stop here or start here. And then we have an integer, we can say a fixed number of rows in one direction or the other. So let's take a look at our roll running total. 
Now, if you've ever had to do a running total in T-SQL, it's kind of complicated to roll your own code for that. This is going to make that a lot easier because we can simply say we want to look a certain number of rows back, sort of like a rolling 12 or, or some sort of financial report like that would have on it. In this case, we want to look at the rows between unbounded preceding and current row as our roll running total. We want to get a running total across the entire result set. And then the next sum function that we've put in says rows between three preceding. So we want to look three rows back and start there and end the sum at the current row. And that will be the sum of the last four, including the one that we're looking at right now. Let's execute this code and you can get an idea of how that's going to look in practice. So starting with row one, we roll a five, our running total is five, and the last four is five. The next roll is a one, so we increment these up. The next roll is a five, that brings us to 11. The next roll is a 19, that brings us to 30. The fifth roll is a seven. So our running total will increment up to 37 now, but the sum of the last four will only be the sum of seven plus 19 plus five plus one, four rows. And when we do that, we get 32. So it's actually pretty simple. You can do unbounded preceding and unbounded following, which is look as far as you can forward. You can do current row and unbounded following. So if you need to count up something in all the rows that have yet to come from the perspective of the current row you're in, you can do that too. And now that we've explained how this rows between clause works, let's go back to the first value and last value and see if we can figure out how to make that behave the way we expect it to behave as opposed to the way Microsoft says it should behave. We're back to our first value, last value query, and we're trying to figure out how it is we can make last value behave the way that we expect it to. Because right now it's not doing that. Let's look at the results again. So we want first value and last value to match up with the very first record and the very last record. We don't want to partition by anything. Right now, first value is doing exactly what we'd expect it to. The trouble is last value isn't. What's happening with last value is it's actually treating our order by as a partition by. So you'll notice as soon as the date changes, the last value changes. Now it's January 2nd and our last value is one. And of course the last value on January 2nd is one. So that's what's going on. And we can further confirm this by adding player ID to the order by clause. And let's see what happens to that roll last column. The last roll by player one is a seven. The last roll by player two coincidentally is a seven, but the last roll by player three is a two. So yes, that's indeed what's happening. The order by gets misconstrued, in my opinion anyway, as a partition by. We don't want that. But the problem is we can't add a partition by to open things up. We have to figure out a way of working with it the way it is with the order by, because order by is required for first value and last value. The way that we can fix this up is using what we just learned about the rows between. So what we'll put in here is rows between unbounded preceding and unbounded following. Because right now, we're getting this goofy partition by behavior that involves unbounded preceding and current row. And we don't want that. We want it to look at the very first row and the very last row. So let's add this rows between unbounded preceding and unbounded following and see what happens. What we really want to see, and we'll double check this, is 10. And we want to see 10 all up and down that column the way we see five up and down the first row column. So let's run this and see if that fix will fix it. Indeed it does. So if you ever use last value and you want to look across the entire result set, you don't want to partition by anything, make sure that you add rows between unbounded preceding and unbounded following Otherwise, you will get weird results. You will get stuff that is partitioned by your order by. You do not want to deal with that. So let's scan all the way down. And yep, 5 and 10, top to bottom. Perfect. 
All right, so first and last value, very useful. You just have to know that last value is a little bit messed up compared to the way that you and I might expect it to behave. Thank <laughs> you.